New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. You can now download a free PDF copy or purchase a beautiful printed edition of Issue 5 of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be looking at drugs and culture. My guest is Mike J. He is a cultural historian and a freelance journalist, author of numerous books, including Psychonauts, Drugs and the Making of the Modern Mind, Mescaline, A Global History of the First Psychedelic, The Influencing Machine, High Society, The Central Role of Mind-Altering Drugs in History, Science, and Culture, This Way, Madness Lies, and Emperor of Dreams, Drugs in the Nineteenth Century. Mike is based in the United Kingdom, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be with you, Jeff. I've been reviewing your your books. At first, I was really interested in interviewing you because of your most recent book on Psychonauts, which is a real big interest of mine, and I know we'll come back to it, but I've come to see you largely as not just a, a student of drugs and drug culture, but really a, a cultural historian in, in general, that your work touches on medicine, it touches on media, it touches on cultural history in general, and it's, it's that large lens through which you, you look at the role of drugs both on the individual and in culture as a whole. Yeah, I, that's, uh, you know, I'm not an academic, I'm not a specialist, and uh, drugs is a great subject if you're prepared to put up with the stigma, which I'm like, okay with. Uh, it's a great subject uh, uh, for a generalist because you get to range across and often cherry pick the most interesting bits uh, from, you know, both sides of the two cultures, from the arts and the sciences and from medicine and uh, from philosophy and from psychology and uh, uh, anthropology and uh, our cultural life generally. And I gather from your writing that you, you began this work in the 1990s. That's right. I was uh, a young kind of journalist. I was working in TV and film and looking around for stories. And uh, uh, that was a time, I mean, we think back now and, you know, that seems to be the decade of kind of when everybody was out in huge open air raves and when drug culture really took off. And uh, yeah, that was, um, that was, that, that was true, certainly, at least in my experience. But there was a great um, silence about all this in the media. You know, there was drugs were always approached in a way, you know, that we still get, uh, which is the idea that they have to be framed somehow as a problem. You know, what should we do about this drug problem? So every story was kind of about addiction or crime or crack babies or um, cannabis psychosis. And uh, nobody was really talking about, well, what are these things and why do people take them and what do they do and how do they manifest more broadly in our culture? So those were the questions that I set myself. And the other thing that I was interested in at that time, I was a very early adopter on the internet. And, uh, you know, back in the dial-up days before, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the Netscapes and browsers. And uh, um, one of the very first cultures to colonize the internet was uh, 
was was drugs there were all these kind of alt news groups and that suddenly that was you know because there was enormous ignorance about the subject and suddenly that was the first time i encountered a community of people who really knew what they were talking about and could talk about everything from chemical recipes to street drug prices to history and culture and so it was uh, it was and that i think changed the language in of the sort of our public conversation about uh, about drugs so yeah back in that moment so that was uh, when I first started writing about the subject. And then, um, you know, the question that uh, kind of popped into my mind was, well, where did all these things come from? Because I'd kind of grown up like everybody else, assuming that uh, they kind of emerged in the 1960s. But I started to realise, of course, all these things we call drugs have much, much longer histories. They all have very different histories from different cultures and different parts of the world. And this was all fascinating and unexplored. So that was what launched me. I guess I'm a bit older than you. I did come of age in the 1960s. <laughs> and and I, I know the 1990s, I mean, for me, it, drugs were almost pretty passe by, by the 1990s. Mm -hmm. But in the 60s, it seemed like something revolutionary w was going on, not just with drugs, but, uh, of course, with computers at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, uh, I, I got drawn into the drug culture at the same time, roughly, that I developed an interest in parapsychology and mysticism. And I assumed that all of those things were, were going to have revolutionary impact. And I think if, if we look back today, we can say the internet did have revolutionary impact, but I'm not sure that uh, parapsychology or the drug culture or uh, UFOs, which was another big interest of mine in, in those years, I think they all still have potential to revolutionize culture, but haven't done so yet. That's right. I think I, I mean, I grew up as a teenager reading a whole lot of the stuff that uh, you were, you know, lucky enough to actually participate in firsthand. But I think part of that message that came from the 60s about drugs was uh, from its evangelists was the idea that, wow, this is total uh, evolutionary shift. And, you know, we're going to be completely different from any previous generation of humanity. And nobody has ever done this before, you know, and that was... Um, mirrored back on the other side of the cultural divide by drug warriors going, this is an unprecedented existential threat. You know, so both sides were happy to collude in the idea that drugs had only emerged in the 60s. And there were very few people I discovered when I broke through and tried to look behind it and think, well, where did cocaine come from in the first place? You know, what was the history of cannabis before it became a street drug in the West? Suddenly there were all these fascinating stories that were very little known and very little explored. And and uh, that became a very productive, generative path for me. You write about the use of drugs in, in the biological world uh, by animals and how the earliest humans probably discovered these drugs by watching animals. Yeah, there, I mean, we get this in myth quite a lot. And uh, if you look at the origin stories of something like coffee, for example. The story is that there was a, a Yemeni goat herder with his goats and he noticed that they were chewing these particular beans and getting frisky. You know, then you cross the planet to the South Pacific and uh, uh, something like kava, the uh, sort of uh, narcotic uh, drink that's uh, uh, used over there. You know, all the origin stories of that go back to observing animals. And that makes sense to me um, because one of the odd things about uh, psychoactive drug use is it's pretty much a human cultural universal. Uh, it's very hard to find any culture, uh, you know, across the globe or throughout history that doesn't use psychoactive drugs in some ways. And in the famous list of human cultural universals, it was, uh, you know, altering your, altering your consciousness with drugs is kind of one of the couple of dozen things that we all do. So that suggests to me, that we must have been doing it before we were human, that when we kind of uh, emerged into humanity, we were coming already from a tradition of using uh, psychoactive drugs in different ways that we can still see. I mean, other, you know, ones that we see every day that are, you know, what happens to cats when they take catnip, for example, you know, that's something that has no effect on us, but it clearly has, uh, you know, powerful effects on them. And we know from having uh, wired them up that they're hallucinating when they sort of in their um, uh, catnip ex 
ecstasies and, you know, maybe it kind of, uh, you know, sort of um, makes, the, you know, brings them into sort of fertility as well. So there are all kinds of reasons. And then when you get to, you know, the monkeys and primates, the great apes, our closest cousins, um, you know, they have a lot of quite uh, well-directed drug-seeking behaviour and they pick up drug habits very easily from us in captivity. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's... Um, it's interesting to frame the story in that way because, uh, you know, it, it, it gives us new perspectives on where all this might be coming from. Well, I thought one of the most interesting stories you've written about had to do with laboratory rats and how, how they were given certain drugs. They had to press a button and they would get a, a dose of the drugs. And the, as I recall, some studies would show that the, the rats would even give up food in in order to get this stimulus uh but then when you you write about how the, how the if the rats were taken out of their tiny little cages and given a a larger environment where they could play and enjoy themselves they, they preferred not to have the drug yeah, I found that um, fascinating. I mean, that goes back to sort of post-war 1950s experiments on rats where people wired them up and found what they thought was a pleasure center in their brain where they would keep on stimulating themselves and, uh, you know, uh, sort of pushing that little lever until they dropped. So, uh, um, I mean, it's actually now, you know, it's it, we don't necessarily think that they are experiencing pleasure. We think that that was probably something more like desire than pleasure, just a compulsion to repeat. Uh, but it became a measure when people were trying to test or evaluate the addictiveness of different drugs. How many times will this rat push the lever? And that's going to tell us, you know, how many times more addictive cocaine is than heroin or whatever. Uh, and yeah, it was this um, uh, Canadian uh, experimenter called Bruce Alexander, who, uh, who sort of who came to wonder what we were actually testing here. So he thought he'd set up a control, which he called Rat Park, which was a very rich environment for rats, in which rats, who were, of course, naturally gregarious, could all live together. They had uh, he even painted little trees and forests in the backdrop and gave them all kinds of toys to play with. And in this environment, then, they weren't very interested in the drugs. And uh, if you gave them... Uh, uh, water with sugar in and water with morphine in. They, you know, they pick the plain water over the morphine water. And, uh, uh, if they had injuries, they'd drink the morphine water until their injuries had healed. And then they'd drop it and just go back to the sugar water or the plain water. So Bruce Alexander said, well, what are we really testing here? Are we really testing the addictiveness of the drugs or are we actually testing just how much, you know, pain and misery we're inflicting on these little rats in cages? I think it, it says a lot about the human condition. And for example, the apparent epidemic of, of prescription drug use in our society today may be more a reflection of our social conditions than the addictiveness of these drugs or the way the pharmaceutical companies are pushing them. I think that's certainly right. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's part and parcel of modernity. If you look at the rise in these drugs from cocaine in the late 19th century and then amphetamines and also sedatives, opiates, and then later barbiturates, uh, you know, this is a time in our um, society when, uh, uh, you know, we're having to work more and more to the dictates of the machine and the factory and uh, the office. And, uh, you know, we have very regimented days where we have to be up at a certain time and we have to, uh, you know, be always on in our work times. And then when we get to our leisure time in the evening, it's very brief and we want to make the most of it. And I think in those situations, you know, in this sort of circumstance in which we live, stimulants and sedatives are very useful and you can see how they're kind of so much part of all our days of uh you know waking up and having that morning coffee and then like a gear change in the evening with a beer or a glass of wine and you know there's a as you say a prescription element to this you know these um 
uh, stimulants and sedatives are prescribed for all kinds of different conditions, depression and anxiety and so on. And they were very widely prescribed at uh, different times in the 20th century. And then there are also, you know, once we look at uh, our street drugs, our illicit drugs, um, there's a lot of cocaine and amphetamines. And, uh, you know, these days, certainly a lot of uh, um valiums and sedatives um, so it seems to me that uh, there's something about our modern lifestyle that makes it natural for us to have recourse to these things that can as it were speed up time or slow it down or give us a bit more energy temporarily or take it away i suppose it's fair to say that throughout human history and in most cultures the the primary drug has been alcohol that's been the case in Western culture, uh, not so much in other cultures around the world, in uh, in Asia or in um, uh, the Americas. Uh, I think, um, you know, people talk about the psychoactive revolution as being a long process that we're going through that started really with um, Columbus and the sort of first voyages and the beginning of global trade. And uh, a lot of those early commodities that drove global trade were... Uh, sugar, tobacco, coffee, tea. And these went from being very specific um, to a certain culture to becoming tobacco was the first, I guess, that became a global drug that got exported around the world in all kinds of different ways. So it, when the Portuguese took it to Africa, where people developed this habit of smoking it with sort of big pipes and then kind of round to Asia, where people developed water pipes and uh, uh, then started chewing it and uh, and and so on. So uh, I think, you know, we could maybe see if we went back 500 years, um, the drug habits, the sort of global drug habits would be a patchwork where there would be one or two particular drugs that were accepted in each particular culture. And what's happened over the last few centuries of the sort of globalization has been like these little patches all running together into a multicolored kind of ever more complex tapestry where everybody's taking everybody else's drugs as well as their own. You've written about drugs that that are used by hundreds of millions of people uh, to which I have uh, personally never been exposed, like kava. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found um, kava fascinating. I mentioned it earlier and I was lucky enough to spend some time in the South Pacific in Vanuatu and uh, I was became fascinated by that as a different type of drug culture because it's really a drug monoculture. Uh, kava is all there is. I mean, this is a part of the world where, um, you know, there's not a lot of, um, you know, economic activity and uh, things that come from a long way are expensive. So, uh, uh, you know, a, a beer or a packet of cigarettes, you know, was was pretty expensive. Most people didn't have access to them. and But the, what they did was have access to kava, which is a drink that has to be prepared fresh. It's from the root of a pepper. So people go up in the afternoon and uh, um, dig up a, this big pepper root and then they sit around in the late afternoon uh, grating it up and mixing it with water and making this kind of uh, rather milky suspension that then people sit around in the evening and drink off, uh, out of coconut shells. And... Uh, it's very variable. It's a, it's a, it's a, a exclusively a cultivar now. Every, you know, there's no wild carver, but everybody has grown their own type of carver that they favor for particular occasions. So it's very socially coded. You know, there are certain types of carver that you would bring to a wedding and it would be different if you were from the in-laws family. And, you know, so it's, there's a lot of ritual associated with it and, uh, uh, particularly when different communities meet, but it's also something that, um, People do socially in the evening, like we do with beers. You know, we sit around and drink it and, uh, you know, everything goes kind of quiet and you listen to the surf on the beach. But people have quite deep experiences with it. They can break out of that circle and go and sit on the beach and listen. And maybe in the waves, they'll hear the voice of their ancestors or they'll hear a prophecy. You know, quite often that's how religious movements get going there. So we have these neat little pigeonholes. Oh, this is a recreational drug and that's a medical drug. And this is a sort of ritual drug or that's a sacrament. But yeah, something like carver, I find very interesting because it, it's all of these things at the same time. You pointed out that there is a, a sexist 
component to to kava as well as certain other drugs that it's it's something the men do together yeah that's right it's quite i mean a lot of social activity is kind of demarcated by gender you know in every society around the world and often one of the ways this is demarcated is with with drug use so yeah kava traditionally is a male thing it would only be men who would prepare it in the afternoon and they would be in a special sacred place where women aren't allowed to tread and so on uh and um but when you go to kava bars in the towns and cities kind of everybody's doing it in the same way that if you look at the west now and look at the prevalence of say a drug like um cocaine or ecstasy you know they're pretty much split across the genders so i don't think there's anything kind of intrinsic about drugs being a male or a female thing but what i think they are is you know as in many many other ways they're very good at uh, demarcating social differences and i think they particularly tap into that idea that the female social space is domestic is in the home is child rearing and is cooking and the male space is around kind of ritual and uh, intoxication and uh, you know sort of private male society so you often see those uh, map onto each other yeah in, in fact, just this morning, I ran into a magazine article, or it was an advertisement, suggesting, and now that I think about it, it was actually an article suggesting it's okay now for women to drink beer. Right. Okay. So there you go. I, so I guess that I guess that, that that's progress from the from the male half of the population, anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, but you could say the same about social class as you could with. Uh, um, with, with with gender here you know here in here in britain you know we we drink tea a lot as you know and uh you know most of us drink tea out of a out of a mug usually a kind of um tannin stained mug but if you went uh you know to sort of uh some stately home you'd be served in um porcelain cups with a sort of uh, tea set and probably you'd get a different set of cups from you know if royalty visited they'd get something a little higher grade and this is a bit like if you look at uh, betel nut chewing in asia for example um you know betel nut sets can be very simple things just like a little uh, board that you put across your knee uh, but they can often be very very fine and fancy lacquered with that red Chinese uh, lacquer with little um, little little pockets you know like little tiffin box sets for all the different uh, elements that you're going to fold into your beetle leaf so uh, I think you could say the same about drugs and um, class and social status as well. When it comes to uh, the use of drugs there's also the prohibition that that surrounds certain drugs in in some cases like in the 1920s in the United States the prohibition was quite severe but there's then there's always these a variety of ways of getting around the prohibition yeah that's right i think um as I said, you know, you don't get so many drug prohibitions if you look at history because, uh, you know, if you go back far enough, people would just have their own drugs that they recognized and used and it wouldn't occur to anybody to use a different drug. Uh, you don't have to go very far back in our culture for that if you go back to... Um, say the 1950s and you look at cannabis that was kind of seen as a deviant habit you know that you might find if you're a black jazz musician you might encounter it but if you were um, you know living out in the suburbs you wouldn't you know and uh, there was really no need to uh, prohibit cannabis very heavily uh, back in those days to straight middle class society because how would anybody get hold of it how would they know what to do with it and they wouldn't enjoy it once they did so I think prohibition is something that happens kind of as part of this uh, globalization of drugs, where new drugs come in from other parts of the world. And they're often seen as foreign. You know, we don't, our drugs is a word that we don't really apply to our own drugs. Nobody calls a coffee a drug. Nobody calls a beer a drug. You call them drugs when they come from somewhere else, right? So I think um, the prohibition of, uh, of, of drugs is really about, um, kind of 
sort of demarcating what's our culture and what isn't, you know, and, you know, there was a sense, in, I think, in the 1920s from the people who were pushing prohibition was that real Americans, you know, were kind of from an older Anglo-Saxon culture and they went to church and they were very religious and America was now being uh, invaded, as they would say, by, you know, people from Ireland and Italy and Germany and from these drinking cultures and there were more people going to the saloons and they were to the church and it was kind of about making a stand that uh, you know we in America are not um, you know these kind of drinking dissolute people and uh, you can see how the war on drugs has unfolded in the same way you know so much of it is about uh, you know it's not about challenging our right to uh, have a martini or a cigar it's about those other drugs that those different people take. I understand that maybe in the 18th century or 17th century, coffee itself was regarded as rather scandalous. Yeah, it was. Uh, there was, um, I mean, all of these things were banned at different times in different places. Tobacco was banned. Uh, chocolate was, was, was banned. Well, it was kind of exclusively available to Jesuits and, you know, you, so it's, uh, you could be slung in jail, you know, as, you know, Columbus's shipmates were slung in jail when they came back smoking tobacco pipes. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, so coffee definitely was something that, um, was suspicious that came from outside and had to have a new, um, kind of social space made for it. The coffee house in, um, 17th and 18th century uh, Europe and Britain particularly and that became kind of rapidly quite an upmarket space quite middle class the idea with it's that uh, you know that's what if you didn't want to go to a tavern and start drinking your beer at uh, 11 o'clock in the morning then you could go where all the other smart business people went and uh, to a coffee house and drink maybe coffee maybe tea maybe even beer you could get that there too but the newspapers would be there and it would be a place for slightly more elevated conversation so, yeah, coffee went from being uh, a kind of suspicious outsider drug to becoming a mark of status. Well, to jump around a little bit, Mike, I, I'd like to talk about the use of drugs in the ancient world, and in particular, drugs associated with religious ecstasy, uh, uh, like the, the mysterious Soma that's written about in the Rig Veda, one of the oldest spiritual scriptures on, on the planet, or the suggestion that drugs were central to the Eleusinian mysteries in ancient Greece. As we've already mentioned, you know, there are very few cultures, you know, going back through history where psychoactive drugs or mostly plants at that time aren't uh, used in some ways and they definitely had uh, religious or spiritual uses uh the um the rig veda as you say kind of talks a lot about uh, soma which it describes in uh, in, in in various ways as uh, um as a as a as a plant or you know it might be a combination of plants but certainly something that was used in a ceremonial way and uh uh, prepared by a, a, a priest craft. And, um, that maybe that then, you know, later in the hi history got kind of substituted with other non intoxicating substitutes. It seems to me that tends to happen when you, once you get texts coming along and religions of the book and particularly once, um, religions leave their original kind of tightly controlled cultural milieu and start spreading, you know, whether through conversion or adoption to all kinds of other cultures. Then you've got other cultures where these uh, traditional sacraments don't have quite the same meaning. But once this is a literate culture, then the text can be the thing that spreads the uh, message. So I think um, Soma speaks to a time that uh, isn't very well documented in uh, in ancient literature that's mostly pre-literate but a time when you know much as you might see in somewhere like the Amazon or Central America today among indigenous people there are lots of uh, different plants which have different um, uh, psychoactive properties and uh, used in ritual and ceremony and take up a very central kind of important place in the culture. Some religions seem to be centered around drugs. There's been some literature suggesting that the the Catholic Mass, that the earliest Christians, when when they had Mass and drank wine and ate the wafer, that those were psychoactive substances. There's such a 
um, enormous number of uh, things that feed into that uh, culture as it emerges. It's certainly possible that uh, some of those involved, um, you know, plants and uh, intoxicating plants. And then there are new religions today, like the Native American church or Santo Daime, where, where the religion, again, centers on the idea of a psychoactive substance, sometimes very powerful, like ayahuasca or peyote, as the central religion ritual of the church. Yeah, that's right. I've, um, uh, I've, I've been lucky very lucky in um spending some time with uh some uh with native american church uh, members uh, my, particularly among the comanche people who are one of the first people to adopt the peyote and i've uh, been fascinated by the story because of course this wasn't a traditional part of their culture uh in their times of freedom it was only in forced captivity on the reservations that uh, uh what we what was initially called the peyote religion and then later became the Native American church was adopted. And, um, yeah, this was, I think, um, something that emerged from, uh, from prohibition in the sense that, uh, um, one of the things that was, uh, prohibited on the, uh, reservations by the missionaries and the, um, uh, federal, uh, officers, uh, was, um, singing and dancing, you know, the ghost dance, obviously, after wounded knee, but also the sun dance. And, uh, this was, um, really so central, I think, to Native American culture, this communal trance this idea of everybody being together in an ecstatic space or all, all altering their consciousness together that once that couldn't be done through singing and dancing um peyote presented itself as another way and i think that's why the uh um uh the peyote um meeting takes place in a teepee at night because it was clandestine it was it was hidden you were hiding it from the authorities but it created this space where the old ways were still alive and uh it was kind of like the old um you know life of freedom in microcosm around the fire and uh it kept that uh, culture going and uh, nurtured it through you know two generations of uh you know genocide really an intense cultural repression and uh it became a real focus for uh native american culture and its survival i think what's happened with uh, the santo daime churches in brazil which are very very popular in the big cities in rio and sao paulo where so many people are um you know from uh sort of uh poor working classes uh with very little um you know participation in the urban culture but everybody had grandparents who were from the uh from the jungle from the amazon and they have roots in that culture and in sort of shamanism so uh, i think it's no surprise that in those contexts then uh, santo daime which is kind of a, a sort of branch of catholicism um but very inflected with uh indigenous language and with the ayahuasca as its sacrament you can see how how strongly appealing that is to uh uh you know, lots of uh, second generation, uh, you know, uh, urban arrivals from, uh, from, from the Amazon and from that indigenous world. One of the most fascinating things that you've written about is the idea that uh, using a drug is really a learned process. At first, they don't taste good. Uh, they, they, they may not even feel good. People vomit. Uh, the, the reaction can be very unpleasant. It might even be thought of as poisonous or, or pathological. So to take a substance that is regarded as a poison and to turn it into something of a, a religious ritual to attain a, a state of ecstasy requires a, series of steps that any individual has to go through that's right there's uh i mean we probably um I and mean, i'm sure some of us had our first sip of whiskey or our inhaled our first lung full of tobacco and thought wow this is great but i think for the most for the majority of people it's pretty unpleasant so you wouldn't persist unless you had a sense that there was a reward to be had at the end of it so uh I think uh, that's a sort of meaning that certain drugs build up in 
certain cultures that, uh, you know, this is actually great if you learn how to do it. And, um, yeah, there was some wonderful work by a um, psychologist in the 1950s looking at um, uh, cannabis and, well, becoming a marijuana user. Is, uh, the, the, the paper was called and it said, well, first of all, obviously, you've got to learn how to smoke a joint or whatever, but then you've got to recognize the effects. And most people... The first few times they smoke a joint, they don't notice anything much or maybe they just pass out. Uh, but you've kind of got to learn that this sort of dizzy feeling is actually kind of pleasant. And it's, uh, you know, uh, this um, sort of uh, slight crazy intensity is uh, if you're sharing it with other people, can be very funny and goofy. And you can make strange uh, imaginative co connections that other people can share. And, uh, you know, eventually if you... Um, you know, smoke cannabis with other people of sort of a similar frame of mind, then you can all decide that um, you're having a good time. But it's not, it's not something that happens instantly. It's something that has to be developed. You have to learn to e even recognize the symptoms and, and then have a, a, a label or some way of identifying that these things are positive. That's right. And you have to, yeah, and you have to have... Um, uh, a sense of a use to which they can be put. You know, I think that's true of a lot of psychoactive drugs. They're, you know, they're very useful. They extend our reach and our range in certain ways. You know, if you've got a long drive to do, you might want to have a strong coffee, you know, or if you're sort of, a, a, you know, a professional if a truck driver or whatever, you know, you've probably got, um, you've probably got your supply of pills that keep you awake. And, uh, you know, there's nothing particularly pleasant about these initially they're kind of bitter to taste but then you learn that they've got a function and then after that you seek them out and uh, you know you figure out where you can buy them and if they're not legal you figure out how you can get them some other way and uh, uh, yeah so, so, but if you didn't have a sense of a use that you were going to put um, put these things to then uh, they wouldn't be quite so interesting and I think we see that you know with psychedelics also uh one of the things that looking at the history of um, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, which, of course, uh, suddenly became, uh, you know, fascinating to our Western culture in the 1950s when Gordon Wasson went to Mexico and uh, uh, discovered a culture in which they were still being used and met uh, uh, Maria Sabina, uh, the, uh, the traditional healer who gave him his first dose of mushrooms and uh, then from that, we elaborated the idea that this was kind of a sacrament of an ancient pre-Christian religion. And uh, also then he passed them these mushrooms on to Albert Hoffman, who identified psilocybin in them. So it was a double whammy. Not only were these mushrooms part of some in hidden, secret, suppressed ancient practice, but they also, you know, cutting edge chemistry validated that they had this new drug in that we didn't know about before. So from that point on, um, you know, magic mushrooms are fascinating to our culture. But before that, I've kind of gone back and looked at this and wondered where they are, because, of course, here in Britain, they, they grow everywhere. And uh, there are quite a lot of accounts of accidental intoxications where you see uh, some doctor has written up. Uh, I saw somebody who'd been foraging for mushrooms and they'd eaten some and they were in a very crazy state and delirious and their uh, uh, pupils were dilated and they thought they were going mad. And uh, if you look at all these experiences, they're all terrible bad trips you know because you know if, if you don't know what you're expecting if you don't know that there's you know a mystical revelation or a healing experience to come then the first thing you think is well i've eaten some mushrooms that aren't agreeing with me i'm feeling these strange sensations maybe they're poisonous maybe i'm gonna die and so you carry that to your doctor and your doctor says okay we'd better give you a stomach pump you know so that's a completely different context for the experience and uh you know it's no surprise that uh all those experiences were thought of as um you know toxic episodes and not to be sought out or repeated we're starting to put the, our fingers here on the question of consciousness itself and, and the, the idea that particularly the psychedelics seem like powerful vehicles for altering consciousness. But in, in some instances, people enter into a, a state of paranoia uh, 
In other instances, people, there's a word metanoia. It's, it's like a very thin, thin line be, between a higher state of consciousness and a, and a lower state of consciousness. And culture seems to have a lot to do with that. That was one of the fascinating things about um, psychedelics and other psychoactive drugs. I think um, I've written a lot about the discovery of nitrous oxide and ether and chloroform, which as well as you know, turning out to be incredibly useful as medical anesthetics, also gave people these incredibly intense moments of, um, you know, uh, sort of transport and revelation. You know, you didn't inhale them and suddenly you'd start to feel as if you're... Um, body and um you know mind were coming unglued from one another and then you might have an out of body experience so then you come back to earth with this sense that you had the whole secret of life revealed to you and these were the kind of experiences that before that point people knew about them but they were visionary experiences they were usually interpreted in religious terms or else they happened in extremis you know when you were in a delirium or a high fever or a psychotic episode or near death or something and then once these um these drugs were discovered suddenly it was possible for anybody to have these experiences more or less whenever they wanted them you just had to have a decent chemistry set or an access or access to what you wanted and uh, then i think that also broadened people's understanding all kinds of experiences that would have been seen automatically as religious or spiritual experiences people started some people still experienced them that way but other people thought uh, maybe this is some um, some part of the mind that I'm not normally in touch with that's talking to me. You know, maybe this is just some glitch in my brain or, you know, maybe there's another dimension out there and these, um, you know, these entities I'm meeting exist on the astral plane or suddenly there was a great plethora of possible interpretations. Once, so drugs on the one hand made these experiences more easy to attain and then also um, made it more easier to find a whole different range of possible understandings of what they might mean. As a cultural historian, I, I guess one of the biggest questions uh, that comes up is w what role do drugs play in the arts and in literature and, and drama? We talk a lot about um, medicine and healing, and then we talk a lot about spiritual experience. Um, but I think... Um, I think with all of these things, it's kind of hard to generalize. And I think it is with art and creativity, too, because that has many different stages. There's a stage of incubation or inspiration, you know, before you start creating the work. And uh, obviously that draws on experience and Drugs are very intense experiences, you know, whether good or bad. So if people have those experiences, they feed into their art in all kinds of ways. And then, you know, there's a the moment of actual creation when you're really in the kind of grip of it. And uh, I mean, there are, you know, plenty of examples of people who wrote on amphetamines or whatever for energy. But I think by and large, you know, that kind of writing, literature or musical composition, um, to, tends to be best done straight. I think where that moment of inspiration is really kind of where you really see drugs being involved in that process a lot is much more with music and dance and, uh, you know, improvisation and things where you're in the element, particularly groups of people who are all in, in sort of, uh, you know, in an altered state of consciousness together. So uh, I think there's uh, a huge, I mean, I, I, and I think that goes much deeper than the sort of question of whether um, drugs kind of make people more creative or inspire art or not. Once again, I'd be keen to uh, patch them into a broader culture and part of our broader experience that can be used in so many different ways at different stages of the process. To the extent that art emerges from bohemian types of culture, those are the same cultures where drug, drugs have been used even when the mainstream culture was not. Yeah, that's certainly true. And that starts, I think, uh, with the Romantic movement, which privileged, um, you know, personal individual experience, you know, which was, uh, art became, you know, less about being formally accomplished and being able to paint or write beautifully. It was more about whether, you know, the strength of your feeling and your sensations and how well you could communicate your individual experience. And, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, that, uh, I've met the discovery of nitrous oxide, for example, which I think is really the beginning of what we now call psychedelic 
science, you know, which happened in a, a medical clinic and around 1800 with uh, Humphrey Davy, the chemist, synthesizing it and inhaling, you know, big balloons of it. And uh, the first thing he did was like, I must take this to my friends, the romantic poets, uh, Robert Southey and then Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who joined in the experiments. And uh, then we think of figures like Thomas de Quincey, who, uh, you know, in the Confessions of an Opium Eater, who kind of figured out a new way of writing memoir here. I'm going, to, I'm going to write this about my relationship with opium. That's going to be the way that you're going to get my story and you'll get opium's story as well mingled in with it. And then by the mid uh, 19th century in um, in Paris, I've uh, written a lot about uh, the Club des Hashishins, the, the Hashish Club, which was uh, um, sort of convened by a couple of doctors in mid-century Paris who were very interested to see what all these literary figures would make of uh, swallowing a very large dose of uh, hashish and sitting around the dinner table. And uh, that was pretty much a, <coughs> a roll call of all the sort of famous, you know, Dumas and Flaubert and Balzac and everybody. So uh, the uh, readers of... Uh, French literature in the 19th century pretty rapidly had uh, all kinds of exotic and fantastical descriptions of uh, the sort of hashish trips that uh, their authors were having. And that was very much part of being a bohemian world, being cut loose from, uh, you know, the old hierarchies and the old structures. And uh, once you had groups of people who could set their own rules and behave in the way they wanted, you know, that's when you also get... Um, you know, other phenomena you'll remember from the 60s, like people growing their hair long and staying up all night and, uh, you know, kind of uh, indulging in kind of, uh, you know, much sort of uh, looser, more permissive sexual relations. You know, so I think, uh, you know, that, uh, that was a whole uh, bunch of sort of bohemian cultural tropes that came together, you know, a long time before the 60s did. Also, there is the intersection of drug use with Ritual magic, I, I suppose, epitomized by uh, the work of Aleister Crowley. The magical orders at that time, like the Order of the Golden Dawn that Crowley was a member of, um, officially did not encourage drug use and they didn't use it in their ceremonies. And McGregor Mathers, who sort of uh, was the founder of the order, kind of felt that this was low and profane and, uh, you know, it's, it sapped the will and the, uh, you know, uh, and, um, but there were plenty of people within his circle. Uh, W.B. Yeats was, I guess, the first sort of well-known one before Crowley, who was also a member of the, um, uh, uh, Society for Psychical Research, which is much the same in that, uh, you know, the distinguished uh, um, professors uh, and the scientists who ran it didn't officially encourage people to take drugs and uh, experience altered states of consciousness and describe their experiences. But there were plenty of people within those societies who did. And um so Yates and uh, uh, Maud Gon, a woman uh, who he was... Uh, obsessed with who I was also a spiritual adept they worked together a lot with um uh chloroform and hashish and possibly peyote as well um doing guided meditations and astral travel together um but that was pretty much a quiet thing um by the time you get to Crowley in the early 20th century drugs are definitely kind of um a sort of a bad thing and uh you know nobody wants to be associated with them of course except for the wickedest man in the world. So unlike people like Yates of the generation before, Crowley trumpeted and advertised his drug use and used it as kind of part of his mystique. And um, he's fascinating because he used pretty much every kind of mind-altering drug that was available at the time. He sought them out systematically. <clears throat> he went to Park Davis Pharmaceuticals in Detroit to ask them to make a special preparation of their uh, peyote tincture, a especially strong one that he could use. And he used chloroform and ether and hashish. And, uh, um, you know, so he's uh, he's a fascinating barometer of that. Um, but of course, he kind of... Uh, uh, most of those kind of faded away, but the one that stuck with him, unfortunately, was, um, you know, heroin to which he developed a dependency and, uh, which is very humiliating for him because he was, well, he prided himself on his superior will, but he was, uh, you know, forced to associate with all kinds of uh, people he regarded as low grade and undesirable to keep it going. So, uh, he's a fascinating 
case study in the uh, in, in the uses and abuses and the potentials and the dangers of uh, um, drug induced uh, altered states in spiritual practice. That brings up the word narcotics, and and when it comes to illegal drugs, that's probably the the most frightening word. And heroin, of course, being at least to to my knowledge, among the strongest of of the narcotics. Although I've heard that tobacco might even be more addicting than heroin, for all I know. Narcotics is a curious word because I mean it. It goes all the way back to ancient Greece to Dioscorides, who was the first kind of great pharmacologist. And uh, it just means something that makes you sleep. And uh, so narcotics for Dioscorides were opium, um, but also belladonna and henbane and all those those nightshades and so on. And they were the drugs that people were most um, concerned about in the late 19th century as we got towards the era of temperance and running up to alcohol prohibition. Uh, and the word drugs at that point uh, didn't have the meaning that we're using it, you know, with now. I mean, th- th- because, uh, you know, drugs just meant anything that you could get at a pharmacy, as it still does. We still say drugstore. And, you know, you could go into a high street pharmacist and buy um, heroin or um hashish or cocaine. So when people started using drugs in this kind of um, cautionary or disapproving way, uh, they had to specify which drugs. So people tended to say narcotics. And um, so then when it came to um, 1914 and the Harrison Act and, uh, you know, which was where uh, the uh, sale of these drugs was criminalized for the first time, uh, they were, what were we talking about? We were talking about heroin and um morphine and also cocaine and um uh so cocaine became kind of officially classified as a narcotic even though it's in fact the strongest stimulant known to man at that time you know and it kind of it was anything but a narcotic it uh, didn't make you sleep it kept you awake for for days if you if, if you wanted so uh um narcotics then became i guess the sort of medico legal term for illicit drugs and that's why it's still with us and still has this kind of heavy bad vibe to it well let's talk about uh, heroin i think correct me if i'm wrong william burroughs a, a great writer was uh, used heroin and uh, i think praised it is is that correct Yes, he certainly did. It's had, uh, um, you know, it's had its uh, its devotees throughout uh, throughout history. I mean, at the same time that uh, uh, William Burroughs is writing about heroin, people like Jean Cocteau were writing about opium, and uh, you know, both of them uh, very influenced by De Quincey and the sort of opiated literature of the nineteenth uh, uh, century, which had taken on these associations of kind of decadent fantasy and uh, indulgence and uh, uh, orientalism and exoticism. Uh, yeah, William Burroughs was um, his, his first book uh, was called Junkie. Was about his heroin addiction, and uh, uh, by the time of his famous book Naked Lunch, he was he was trying to give it up, and uh, you know trying different miracle cures, a drug called apomorphine that uh, he was convinced was going to get him off it. But uh, um, for Burroughs, I think it was really, you know, control was a very kind of central theme in his work. Who is trying to control us? You know, how can we be independent of control? So I think that's what fascinated him about heroin was that... uh, it was kind of supposedly controlled, but in fact, you could get hold of it and you could live this life that was nothing like the life you're supposed to live. But then, of course, you know, sooner rather than later, probably it's the heroin starts controlling you and that becomes, you know, the specter of control. How addictive is heroin, actually? Do you, do you know, for example, is it more or less addictive than nicotine? I think it's um, uh, both of them have kind of... Uh, um, have sort of pharmacological components that make them habit forming. But there's, you know, as we, we talk about set and setting a lot in the ter- terms of uh, psychedelics and how much the context affects it. I think the same is true of um, heroin and tobacco. I mean, an awful lot of people go into hospital, you know, have maybe major surgery and probably spend a few weeks on uh, morphine or some other opiate. And uh, when they come away from that, then, uh, 
you know, they're probably clinically addicted and they might easily spend a few nights, you know, sort of sweating and shivering and not sleeping well. Um, but, you know, they're out of hospital. They're back into their life that didn't have heroin in it before. And, uh, you know, they don't, you know, they, they put up with it and get over it. Whereas if you're living a life, um, you know, with uh, stress and trauma and pain, which has driven you to uh, resort to uh, heroin, then, you know, if you can stop taking it and you go back into that same life again, you know, you're obviously, you know, an awful lot more likely to go back to it to medicate all the things that you were taking it for in the first place. I mean, I think it's it's hard to measure, but it's interesting to me that um, if you look at uh, tobacco and uh, nicotine, um, I mean, nicotine patches, presumably, you know, if if we're, all we're talking about is a pharmacological addiction, it makes no difference whether you're smoking a cigarette or sticking a nicotine patch on yourself. But uh, nicotine patches obviously don't do it for everybody. They do it for, you know, a, a significant minority of people. So I think you would suggest, you know, that, that also suggests that um, nicotine is much more, uh, as we would say, addictive for some people and for others and in some situations than others. If you look at where tobacco use really started, one of the things, you know, in the sort of 17th century, one of the great spreaders of it was the, uh, the, the Thirty Years War. And I always think, you know, if you look at the history of warfare, you know, that's really when you want cigarettes. You know, your life is kind of 90 percent sitting around bored and doing nothing and then 10 percent kind of crisis and, you know, fear and danger. And, you know, it seems to me that's the kind of situation where uh, cigarettes come in very, very handy for kind of, uh, you know, because they can sort of uh, focus you or they can calm you down or you can they're very social. You can share them with other people. So I think um, a lot of what we call addiction um, you know, so, uh, it, some of it can be quantified in pharmacological and clinical terms, but I think an awful lot of it, again, is cultural. That's very interesting. Well, Mike, this has been a fascinating excursion in, into a wide realm. I know we've just scratched the surface. I certainly hope uh, to have you back for some interviews where we can go into greater depth. You, you've written an entire book just on mescaline. It's an absolute pleasure, Jeff, to have this conversation with you. It'd be great to talk again. I would love to spend uh, an hour talking to you just about mescaline and the, the history of, of psychedelics. That, that alone fascinates me. And cannabis uh, has, has another story all of its own. And psilocybin has yet another. So uh, uh, I look forward to having more interviews with you. And I'm just delighted to be able to share the breadth of your knowledge with the New Thinking Aloud audience. Oh, it's been a great pleasure, Jeff. Thank you very much indeed for the privilege. Well, thank you for being with me. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here. Book two in the New Thinking Aloud Dialogues book series is a tribute to parapsychologist Russell Targ celebrating his 90th birthday. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.